This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 23, Remy Cohen. On June 6, 2019, every parent's worst nightmare became reality for Ashley and Matt Cohen of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, when they received a frantic phone call from their babysitter saying their infant daughter wasn't breathing. The next day, 16-week-old Remy Joan Cohen was removed from life support. Despite the suspicious circumstances surrounding Remy's death, the babysitter was only questioned once and never investigated, leaving many area residents furious that justice was not served. Remy's mother, Ashley Cohen, joins me on this episode to tell her candid and agonizing account of losing her precious baby girl, why she feels her daughter deserves justice, and how she's keeping Remy's memory alive. This is the shocking, painful story of Remy Cohen. My sources for today's episode were Ashley Cohen, Marjane Frellen, The Sun Gazette, Facebook, GoFundMe, Remy's Teachings Through the Lord, The Loss of a Child Facebook page, Prevent Child Abuse Pennsylvania, Rx List, and Court Documents. Before I get started with this week's episode, I hope everyone likes the new intro music. I've had a few comments about how upsetting the old intro was, so I figured I'd try something different without the sound effects. I hope the new one is better at setting the mood for the podcast. Also, a very happy birthday to Remy's oldest sister, Juliana, who celebrated her birthday this past week. I really want to thank Remy's godmother, Marjane Frelin, for reaching out to me and asking me to look into Remy's story. As soon as I learned the details of what happened to Remy and what didn't happen afterward, I was fully committed to telling Remy's tragic story of untimely death suspicious circumstances, and lack of justice. At just 16 weeks old, Remy Joan Cohen was ripped from the arms of her loving parents, and the person responsible for her death has never been charged. For over a year, Remy's family has grieved the loss of their precious little girl while the rest of the world went on around them. The patience and grace of this family is admirable. Still, anyone's patience is bound to wear thin at some point. Matthew Cohen and Ashley Tedesco met in January of 2016 and married on November 17, 2017. Ashley brought with her into the marriage two beautiful girls, Juliana and Sawyer, and the couple was also blessed with their first child together, a little girl they named Callie. In the late spring of 2018, Matt and Ashley discovered they were pregnant again to their great surprise, as Ashley had recently had an IUD placed to prevent pregnancy. As it turned out, she was already pregnant when the IUD was placed. The pregnancy was stressful and complicated, but this miracle baby was determined. Despite all odds, Remy Joan Cohen was born on February 13, 2019, in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, joining Matt, Ashley, and their three girls, Juliana, who was almost 12, nine-year-old Sawyer, and -and one-and-a-half-year-old Callie. Rem Rem. Hey. Hey. Oh, what? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, tell me. What's now? Yeah, is that what's new? Matt considered Remy his early Valentine's present, and in fact, Remy turned out to be a daddy's girl. Not only did Matt choose Remy's name, but they also developed a special bond. In Matt's own words, times became even more stressful but fulfilling. I will not overshadow the truth. Ash and I went through one of the most trying times in our life with the pregnancy and then trying to manage two preteen young ladies, a rambunctious one-year-old, and now a newborn. Callie was and is consumed with having her mother by her side, 
So through the trying times and a few stressful parenting arguments, Remy and I developed a special connection and bond. I had what I felt Callie and Ashley had. I loved every second of it. Remy was perfect, an angel. She ate every two hours, she slept for two hours, and then woke up and watched Daddy take care of things around the house while she swung. She loved being held, and I got an enormous, unimaginable, and fulfilling smile on her face when I would come home from work, or if she smelt me, or heard my voice. It was perfect. Remy was dedicated on May 19, 2019, at 316 Church, a non-denominational Christian church in Williamsport. After Remy was born, Ashley returned to work as administrator of a healthcare organization. Matt stayed home for the first two and a half months of Remy's life. When he returned to work, he and Ashley felt comfortable sending their infant daughter to the same person who provided daycare for Callie. Ashley's mother, Mindy, was best friends at the time with a woman named Crystal, whose daughter, Megan Borges, had watched Callie during the day for about ten months, and she agreed to take Remy in as well. Megan's last name was somewhat notorious in Williamsport since July 22, 2016, when her cousin, 28-year-old Brittany Renee Borges, made a frantic call to 911. Barely intelligible, Brittany told the dispatcher she had driven to work, forgetting her live-in boyfriend's four-year-old daughter, Samaria Motika, was in the car. Samaria, who was found unresponsive around 3.30 p.m., curled up on the passenger side floor with her head on the seat died after spending six hours locked in Brittany's SUV on a day when outside temperatures crested at 97 degrees, rendering the temperature inside the car at 120 degrees. When taken to Williamsport Regional Medical Center, Samaria's internal temperature was measured at 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Brittany Borges, who was tasked with taking Samaria to daycare that fateful day but said she forgot, was quickly charged with involuntary manslaughter, endangering a child, and recklessly endangering another person. In November of 2018, she was acquitted of all three charges, but she was found guilty of a summary charge of leaving a child unattended in a car while it was running, because she admitted to leaving Samaria in the car while she ran her son into his daycare the morning of Samaria's death. Brittany's penalty for causing the death of her boyfriend's four-year-old daughter? A $25 fine. I have addressed hot car deaths in the past in my post about Lorenzo and Brooklyn Velasquez on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. In that case, however, it was clear that the mother intentionally left her children in the car as an alternative to daycare. I can't say I have an opinion one way or another on Brittany's degree of guilt in this case. I'd have to dig much deeper to make up my mind. Either way, Samaria's death was a horrific, preventable tragedy. May that sweet, playful little girl rest in peace. Anyway, Megan Borges had nothing to do with that case, and her mother was, as I mentioned, best friends with Ashley's mother, so it seemed like the perfect arrangement. Either Ashley or Matt would drop Callie and Remy off at Megan's house each morning on their way to work. The Coens provided Megan with a type of rocking bassinet apparatus called a rock and play, identical to the one in which Remy slept at home, to ensure their daughter had a safe, comfortable place to nap while in Megan's care. Some mornings, when either Ashley or Matt arrived at Megan's house to drop the girls off, Megan was not home, so they would leave Callie and Remy with Megan's mother, Crystal, who always said Megan was at counseling and would be back soon. By early June, the girls had been going to Megan's house for three or four weeks. The Coens had started to notice Megan seeming, at times, drowsy, irritable, or otherwise off somehow, so they had begun transitioning Callie and Remy to a new babysitter, planning to send them to Megan's house a few days per week in the meantime to make the switch less traumatic for the girls. On the evening of June 5th, Matt and Ashley had a disagreement that they left unsettled, so the next morning Matt, regrettably, left the house without kissing his wife and the four girls goodbye or telling them he loved them. He later wrote, That decision alone will haunt me for the rest of my life. I will forever regret my decision to leave that morning without faithfully kissing my wife and children. Matt went to work as usual, laughing and joking with co-workers as he went about his job, finishing earlier than he normally did. Matt wrote, I told myself that since Ashley has done so much for the family and managing my crazy hours, I would go get the girls from the babysitter and be home before she was done work. That morning, Ashley took Remy and Callie to the babysitter's house and went to work like she always did. It was 3.58 p.m. on June 6, 2019, when Ashley received a call from Megan Borges, which she was unable to answer. She returned the call four minutes later. When Megan answered the phone, Ashley couldn't understand her at first. What she was hearing didn't make sense. All she could hear was Megan repeating, And she was purple. She was purple. Immediately, Ashley sensed the babysitter was talking about Remy. Ashley bolted from the building, so flustered she initially forgot her car and had to run back for it. 
Crazed with panic, she drove as fast as she could to Megan's house, nearly getting sideswiped as she maneuvered through traffic. By the time she arrived, the ambulance was pulling away, and Ashley jumped out of her car and attempted to chase it on foot. Megan's mother, Crystal, drove Ashley to the Williamsport Regional Medical Center, where the frantic mother ran to the ambulance in time to see one of the many EMTs gathered around a gurney, administering CPR to her helpless 16-week-old daughter. Ashley later said in a post on a Facebook page dedicated to Remy, The vision of seeing my lifeless child with her arms hanging out to her sides is the most agonizing and debilitating sight I have ever witnessed, and still, to this day, it haunts me. At some point during the chaos, Ashley called her husband, who was still finishing up at work. Matt couldn't make sense of Ashley's screams, but he picked out three horrifying words. Remy's name and the heart-stopping sentence, She's dead. While Matt rushed to meet his wife at the hospital and Remy was whisked into the emergency room, Ashley was escorted by a hospital employee into a separate room down the hall from the area where multiple medical professionals fought to keep Remy alive. Ashley wrote, I remember seeing all the nurses and physicians looking out at me as I walked by, and I started to beg them, Please, please help her, please, that's my baby. Within ten minutes, Matt arrived at the hospital and was led into the room where he found his wife face down on the ground, screaming. Seconds later, a doctor entered the room, told the terrified couple that Remy still did not have a heartbeat, and asked if they could stop CPR. Ashley said she yelled at him, No, go ten, fifteen, minutes, years, I don't care, keep going. Matt recalled insisting, Don't fucking stop. Five minutes later, the doctor returned, telling the Coens their daughter had a pulse and was being prepped for a life flight to Geisinger Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. We've become acquainted with Geisinger during some cases I've recently covered. Kimani Moore was hospitalized there with a bowel obstruction prior to his death. Kendall Doss was scheduled for brain surgery there that never took place. And sadly, Arabella Parker died at the same hospital. Ashley was permitted to accompany her daughter in the helicopter, where they were rushed into the pediatric ICU by a number of nurses and doctors. She wrote, I felt like I was signing my life away as I provided permission for the physicians to attempt to revive my baby with central lines, atrial lines, ventilation, and whatever else was necessary. Eventually, the Coens were allowed in the room with Remy, who was on a ventilator and sprouting with tubes and wires. A doctor told Ashley and Matt that Remy's organs were failing and that their precious 16-week-old baby had been given medication to paralyze her temporarily, as she had begun suffering seizures. The couple watched in despair as Remy's brainwaves were monitored by an EEG. The machine detected no activity. Ashley wrote, I remember just holding her hand and telling her how much I love her. I remember questioning God and asking why he was allowing this. Her body continued to become colder and colder. I knew there wasn't a single chance she'd return. I think she was already gone, but the Lord was giving us time to accept what couldn't be changed and say goodbye. The hospital allowed us to spend the night with her, as our parents, my brothers, and my best friend took turns being by her side. The next morning, the Coens were told that Remy had no brain activity, all of her organs had essentially failed, and she was being kept alive only by machines. Ashley and Matt were forced to make the unimaginable decision to remove Remy from life support. Ashley wrote, We had no choice but to stop the machines and accept that the Lord somehow had bigger and better plans for her. After the gathered family members said their goodbyes, Matt cradled his daughter in his arms, and a respiratory therapist removed her ventilator. At 114 days old, Remy Joan Cohen took her last breath and died in her daddy's arms. After she passed away, Remy's tiny body was sent for an autopsy. Imagine leaving home one day as parents of four beautiful girls, and the next time you step through the door, only three remain. The funeral for Ashley and Matt's tiny, precious daughter took place on Friday, June 14, 2019, at 2 p.m. at Sanders Mortuary in Williamsport, after which she was buried in Montoursville Cemetery. While Matt and Ashley were caught up in a whirlwind of grief and medical activity on June 6, detectives interviewed the babysitter, Megan Borges. Megan told them that Remy had been spitting up profusely that day. Around 2 p.m., Megan said, she herself grew tired and decided to take a nap in her bed with Callie. She put Remy down to sleep on her stomach on a day bed in Megan's bedroom. Megan told investigators she set her alarm for around 4 p.m. because she knew either Ashley or Matt would arrive soon thereafter to pick up the kids. When she awoke, she told the police, she found little Remy purple and not breathing. At that point, Megan called Ashley. After their daughter's death, Matt and Ashley struggled to make sense of the babysitter's story. 
they had provided Megan with a rock and play for Remy to sleep in. The daybed was usually covered in piles of clothing and was located all the way across the bedroom from Megan's bed, as opposed to the rock and play, which was fully portable and could easily be pulled next to her own bed. Also, Remy was accustomed to sleeping in the rock and play since she slept in one at home as well. If Remy was spitting up as profusely as Megan had reported, why on earth would she place the 16-week-old infant on her stomach, out of sight, and fall asleep for two hours? Remy was old enough to hold her head up, but not yet old enough to roll over on her own. Rara, get your head up. Come here. Get your head up. Hey, you. Rara. Hey, you. Yeah? What are you doing? What? Yeah? On top of that, why would someone who was being paid to care for the Cohen's children feel it was appropriate to take a nap in the first place? As it turned out, Megan Lynn Borges had a few skeletons in her closet that Ashley and Matt now wish they knew about sooner. Public court records reveal a robust history of legal troubles for the babysitter born on April 7, 1981. In 2000, at the age of 19, Megan was charged with DUI and hindering apprehension or prosecution. After pleading guilty to both charges, she was sentenced to a period of confinement from two days to 12 months and a maximum of six months probation. She managed to keep her nose clean, so to speak, for the next several years, but it seems she was storing up all her illegal behavior for one big burst. In September of 2008, at the age of 27, Megan was arrested on multiple charges, including burglary, criminal trespassing by breaking into a structure, and forgery, all second-degree felonies, conspiracy to commit burglary, a first-degree felony, and misdemeanor charges of accessing a device issued to another, theft by unlawful taking, conspiracy to commit theft by unlawful taking, receiving stolen property, and possession of a controlled substance. By pleading guilty to the burglary charge, the rest of her charges were dismissed, and Megan was sentenced to 12 months in an intermediate punishment program, otherwise known as IPP. IPP is a sentencing alternative designed for offenders convicted of drug and alcohol-related crimes, which are those motivated by the offender's use of and or addiction to alcohol or drugs. It's considered a less restrictive form of confinement than a prison term. According to Lycoming County President Judge Nancy L. Butts, intermediate punishment is a form of sentence that has some sort of a treatment component to it. Some offenders sentenced to IPP are sent directly to the Lycoming County Pre-Release Center, which is a minimum security facility where inmates can be eligible for work release programs. It is still considered confinement, but it is less restrictive than county prison, and it allows for some freedom to attend drug court, counseling, and other treatment components. It's not clear where or how Megan Borges spent her 12 months in IPP, but court records reveal that she violated drug court guidelines at one point, was found in contempt, and became delinquent on fines she had also been ordered to pay. Megan received a few traffic citations throughout 2009 and 2010, mainly for driving without a license, insurance, or vehicle registration. In June of 2010, she was charged with a parole violation, and in December of 2011, she was removed from her treatment program. Then in 2013, 32-year-old Megan was arrested after attempting to shoplift 27 items at Kmart in Loyal Sock Township. The total value of the items was $172.44. She was transported to Lycoming County Prison, where during a search, officers found her carrying contraband. She was charged with a second-degree felony count of possession of a controlled substance and a misdemeanor count of retail theft, taking merchandise. Megan pleaded guilty to both offenses and was sentenced to confinement of 6 to 12 months. Her last arrest appears to have been in November of 2016, once again for use or possession of drug paraphernalia. The following January, at the age of 35, she pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 12 months of probation and 50 hours of community service. Megan apparently still owes the court upwards of $1,600 in delinquent fines. After I published this post on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com this week, I received a very interesting comment from someone calling themselves D.S., Megan has actually had more issues than even this article is discussing. In 2000, when her son was just a year old, she took him to a heroin house where his father had to break him out. While she insisted she didn't do heroin at the time, many others in the house did while she was on crack. Recently, she was found to be using the substance again. She was beating her 15-year-old daughter, was completely neglectful and verbally abusive to all of her three children. 
When family discovered this, she was encouraged to go to rehab far away from the Williamsport area, but she refused. She has never faced consequences in her entire life, never been held accountable. Now, I don't have proof of those allegations, but if they're true, they do say a lot about the mindset and headspace of Megan Borges. I believe it is safe to say, based on her legal history, that Megan has dealt with some substance abuse issues in her lifetime. Ashley and Matt, forgiving, faithful people who believe in second chances, were aware that Megan had a history of drug use, but they were told she was clean and doing well for quite some time when they allowed her to begin watching Callie as an infant. In truth, by that time, Megan had just barely finished probation for her latest arrest. After Remy's death, the Coens asked investigators to have Megan drug tested, but they were told that could not be done because Megan would test positive for synthetic opioids. Remember how I mentioned that oftentimes in the morning, Matt or Ashley would leave the kids with Megan's mother, Crystal, because Megan was supposedly at counseling? Only after their daughter's death, they learned that counseling was actually Megan's visit to the local methadone clinic, where she was receiving daily doses of methadone before returning home to watch Callie and Remy. The Coens were never made aware of the fact that their trusted babysitter was under the influence of a narcotic commonly used as part of drug addiction detoxification and maintenance. According to Rx List, side effects of methadone can include anxiety, nervousness, restlessness, insomnia, weakness, and drowsiness, among others. Had Matt and Ashley known Megan was taking this narcotic, which can be highly addictive itself, they would never have trusted her with their babies. As far as the investigation into the criminal culpability of Megan Borges for the death of Remy Joan Cohen, after her initial interview with police on the day of the incident, Megan was never questioned again. Ashley told me, They asked her to take a lie detector test, but she declined. They never had her back in for more questioning, and basically took her word for everything. Surely the autopsy results would have prompted further investigation, right? Wrong. Preliminary findings by Montour County Coroner Scott Lynn reveal that Remy's death was unintentional, but preventable. It was inferred that co-sleeping was a primary suspicion of Remy's death. The coroner believed that Remy suffocated, either when Megan rolled over on her, or when Remy rolled into the pillows and blankets and was unable to free herself with no help from her unconscious babysitter. The coroner was not satisfied that Megan's story added up in light of his findings and refused to rule Remy's death an accident. It was not Sid's and there was no trauma. Her cause of death was officially ruled as cardiac arrest due to cerebral hypoxia. He recommended the Lycoming County District Attorney's Office send Remy's case to be reviewed by a medical legal team in Harrisburg, but the district attorney declined to push the case further. According to Ashley, who spoke with the coroner after the fact, he was very unhappy that the Lycoming County prosecutor failed to follow his recommendations. I reached out to Coroner Scott Lynn via email and telephone, but I have yet to hear back. Ashley wrote, Any way you look at it, my Remy suffocated, and the thought of her trying to take just one last breath is the most heart-wrenching, sick pain I have ever felt. According to an organization called Prevent Child Abuse Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Child Protective Services Law, or CPSL, which was signed into law in 1975, is defined as intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly doing a number of things, one of which is creating a reasonable likelihood of bodily injury to a child through any recent act or failure to act. Another is causing the death of the child through any act or failure to act. Good info to have, just in case it comes in handy someday. Ashley lamented, Nothing has been done. I just hope that Remy's story is proof of how much our justice system fails so many victims and their families. A civil lawsuit is pending against Megan Borges on behalf of Ashley and Matt Cohen. Since September of 2019, Ashley has maintained a Facebook page called Remy's Teachings Through the Lord, The Loss of a Child, where she frequently posts eloquent, beautiful blog entries about her daughter, her grief, her emotions, and her faith. Ashley's strength is an indescribably powerful inspiration, and the fact that she has allowed herself to progress through the various stages of grieving while documenting them through expressive prose may offer other bereaved parents hope that they, too, can survive the worst pain and torment life can offer. I cannot recommend the page strongly enough. In January, Ashley wrote about walking through the Montoursville Cemetery, reading the names and epitaphs on the headstones, when she noticed how many of them, particularly in the baby and children's section, bore only temporary grave markers. Ashley wrote, The financial factors that play a role in honoring a deceased loved one isn't something that many of us, especially younger individuals, think about. We expect to grow old, watch our children grow up, have their children, etc., 
Yet our perceptions of death aren't always God's plan for us, and when it's our time to leave this world, we won't be late for that appointment. So, approximately 250 yards away from where my sweet Remy Jones' body lies, there I stood, numb, in the middle of that cemetery, wondering how I could ensure I fulfilled the Lord's purpose for my daughter's short life here on earth. Direct me, O Lord, use my sweet Remy as a vessel, and help me spread your goodness to others. I can't remember if I was walking away from that children's section or driving out of the cemetery, but I remember thinking how desperately I wanted to put a headstone on every plot that had a temporary one, which was years old. I remember thinking if it wasn't for the outpouring of love and generosity of so many people throughout the community, I wouldn't have had the privilege of honoring my sweet Remy the way I desired. As my mind continued to ponder about the financial factors that so many families are burdened with, I couldn't help but wonder how many families feel they aren't able to honor their loved one the way they want due to finances. It's not just a headstone, the burial plot, or cremation. There's also the transportation fees, casket, embalming, paperwork, service fees, and the list goes on and on. I felt that the Lord was calling me to start an organization to do His works. Remy's Purpose Incorporated is a nonprofit organization, soon to be 501c3, founded to provide financial support to bereaved families for cremation or burial services and or burial plot and or headstone. As soon as Remy's Purpose gains its 501c3 status, which Ashley expects to happen within a month, I will be sure to share the information on the blog and podcast social media pages. What an honorable, meaningful, and beautiful way to keep Remy's memory alive. That, too, is why we're here right now, to remember Remy Joan Cohen. According to Remy's obituary, She enjoyed smiles, snuggles, kisses and smooches, being rocked, and tubby time. Remy's biggest smile of love was when she was with her mom, dad, and sisters. In her short life, Remy touched the lives of many. All who knew her will remember her always as their perfect angel. I had the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing Remy's mother, Ashley, for this episode. Today on the podcast, I have a very special guest. I have Ashley Cohen with me, who is the mother of Remy Joan Cohen. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Hi. Would you like to tell me Remy's story? Sure, absolutely. Um, Remy was born on February 13th, uh, 2019, against all odds. She actually was an IUD baby that came out with the IUD. Um, She stayed at home with my husband who was laid off until like mid-May and then he had to return to work. So she went to the babysitter where my other daughter was going to who was 18 months at the time. The babysitter was my mom's best friend's daughter at that time. And um, we had known a little bit about her history that she used drugs and stuff. But that was, from what we were told, it was years and years and years and years ago. And we are, you know, faithful and we believe, you know, in second chances. And, you know, she was very good to Callie. That's my other daughter. So um, when it was time for Remy to start going to daycare, we just um, took her to the same place. It was, I'd say, like June 1st or maybe the end of May where my husband and I started to feel a little uneasy about taking her there. There was just some things we thought were a little weird, Um, some of them being um, the babysitter would be sleeping or seem dozy. And my husband said a couple of times she um, kind of lashed out at him and he said, I don't know what's going on with, with her, but you know, I just don't feel comfortable with the kids going there. So, um, that Monday, I think it was the third, we had started her, um, taking the kids both to a different babysitter. Um, my older one, Callie cried for like an hour after I dropped her and ran me off. And so that was hard for me. So I said to my husband, well, let's keep taking them to the babysitter, Megan, um, a few times a week, and then we'll take them to the new babysitter twice a week. So he was in agreement with that. Well, on that Thursday, June 6th, I received a phone call at 358. Um, and I didn't answer it right away. My mom, uh, is who I work for my boss and we were in the middle of, of a meeting and, um, she had left the office then and I called the babysitter back four minutes later. And when I did, all I could hear was the babysitter saying, and she was purple and she was purple. Well, as a mom, I just, I don't know why I just knew it was Remy that she was talking about. So I, of course, 
through my phone and went running out the door and down the street and then realized I needed my car. So I ran back to my car and then drove over to the babysitters who, you know, was only about a mile from where I work. And as I was pulling up, the ambulance were pulling off. So I followed them to the hospital, the Williamsport Hospital, and pulled up um, as the ambulance were pulling into uh, the emergency section of the hospital. And I'll never forget, I walked, uh, well, I ran up to the back of the ambulance and they had the door open as they were pulling Remy out of the ambulance. And um, there was like six paramedics and one of them had Remy and she was giving CPR and Remy's arms were just flown out to the side and she just looked lifeless. And I just fell onto the ground like this cannot be possible. So um, they took us, they took Remy into the emergency room and started operating on her, trying to revive her. And they put us into a separate room. My mom and I, at that time, my mom had arrived and they came in like 10 minutes later and they asked, can they stop CPR? Um, That Remy still didn't have a pulse. And I said, no, you know, go 20, 30 days. I don't care what it is. I want my baby. And so he left the room and about five minutes later, it wasn't even, he came, the doctor came back in the room and said, we have a pulse. And so I just felt like for a moment I had, you know, hope that this was all going to be okay. Um, They then caught a life flight to Geisinger Medical Center. They allowed me to get on the plane or the helicopter with Remy and sit there. And I remember looking down at the top of her head and I remember praying like, if she's just going to be a vegetable, Lord, you know, take her. You know, I don't want that life for her. So we got to Geisinger and they um, immediately, I felt like I was signing everything over for for them to do all these procedures to try to, you know, get her organs and heart and everything back. And that night, um, it was probably like about midnight at this point, they came out and told us that Remy was seizuring and um, they had to give her some medication to paralyze her. They told us that she was revived with um, some medicine like neuroepinephrine or something to that extent, and that can you know revive a heart that's been gone for hours. Um, but when they tested her organs, they were eighty percent non-functioning, so she only had twenty percent functioning of her organs, and that they did not think that you know Remy had a chance to make it. So they did keep her on life support overnight, and in the morning on June seventh, they called my husband and I into a room, and they said. Um, you know, that this is what you call life support. And Remy, you know, we had a choice to make and Remy's body kept getting colder and colder. And so I asked, can you put brain um, uh, cords on her to, to watch her brain chemistry to see if she has any movement? And they said, yeah, and she didn't. So um, we allowed them to remove um, the machines from her. And um, she died in my husband's arms at 10.02 on June 7th. Um, immediately, of course, I was angry with the babysitter. I wanted to know what happened, you know? So knowing about her history, we had asked the detective to drug screen her. And, um, you know, we wanted to make sure she didn't have anything in her system. A couple of days later, he had told us that um, the drug test, um, which he requested through um, the courthouse or wherever you have to, was declined. And when we asked why, um, he said, well, because um, she goes to the methadone clinic on a daily basis and um, she would test positive for whatever drugs um, that they would test for. And we said, you know, are you kidding? Uh, We knew nothing that she was going to a methadone clinic daily. Um, and then it dawned on us that here we would drop our daughters off there sometimes. Um, and Megan, the babysitter wouldn't be there, but her mom, who was our family friend, uh, would be there. And they would always tell us, you know, Megan's at counseling and it was never counseling. It was the methadone clinic. Well, when the detective ended up telling us the whole story, according to him, or yeah, 
um, from the babysitter, her story was that Remy was spitting up a lot that day. So she put Remy, she wanted to take a nap with Callie and Remy. Um, I guess the babysitter was tired, even though she was supposed to be watching our kids. So she put Remy on her stomach on a day bed in her bedroom that we, when we've ever seen a stay bed, it was piled high with clothes. We didn't even know that this existed. Um, and she, the babysitter said she put Remy on her stomach across the room on a day bed and set our alarm clock at two o'clock for four o'clock, knowing that my husband or, or I get there shortly after four. And she fell asleep with Callie in her bed. Um, she states that when she woke up at four, um, she went over to get Remy and Remy was purple um, on the bed and she was somehow suffocated, which is when they called the ambulance. Now we had given Remy uh, or we had given the babysitter a rock and play that rocks by itself. And it was what Remy had slept in at our house um, since she was born. And so she could have pulled that easily right up to the next, next to her bed and turned that on for Remy to lay in. Um, and she didn't do that. And um, the coroner believes that she actually fell asleep with Remy in her arms and rolled over and suffocated Remy. So, I mean, we live with that, you know, all of, and, and, you know, there's little to none being done about it because the DA states it's circumstantial. And um, now we have a civil attorney involved in, in it. So it's just kind of one of those things we just beat ourselves up over every day, you know, you know, the fact of the matter is that she, this babysitter who's getting paid to watch our kids decides to take a nap. You know, it's like if I'm, I'm in the medical field and if I decide to take a nap on my watch or on, on the hospital's watch, you know, I would lose my job if a patient died because of me, you know? And so the fact of the matter is this lady is being allowed to just run the streets and watch other children. And meanwhile, my husband and I suffer with, the lies and, you know, the guilt of, of taking her to this attic we never knew was still using methadone, you know, that got off freely basically for the murder of our daughter. Well, the um, coroner actually, who I give all of the credit to, um, he believes that the babysitter fell asleep uh, with Remy and rolled over on her. He does not believe the story of her being put on the day bed. Um, he believed it so strongly and said that it bothered him so much um, that they, the DA and stuff weren't doing anything that he called a meeting, um, I guess, with children and youth and medical examiner and, and the detectives in like Cumming County. And he drove here and presented her case um, to them. And he said, the least you could do for Remy is refer the case to um, a place, I guess I would assume like Harrisburg it was. Um, I, I think it's the, like the state DA, the, the overseer of them. I'm not sure what you call them, but okay. anyways, um, he said, that's the least you could do for this little girl that, you know, deserves justice. And um, then he said he received a call a couple weeks later that said they weren't going to pursue anything and that the case was basically closed. And the coroner then called me and said, the fact that they couldn't even send it to the state for another review is just mind boggling. I think his exact words were my DA and I are on the same page, but your DA and I are in a completely different book. Um, and so he said that he would not rule her um, death an accident. Um, so he put on unex unexplained, um, non-SIDS death. Um, he did say that it was absolutely not SIDS. Um, he was able to test. Usually they have an ear infection or a respiratory infection with that. Mm -hmm. He said that they ruled out everything except asphyxiation. And he said, um, you know, that he, he felt strongly that this was not, um, you know, something, it was something that could have been prevented. And he feels like our, the story that we've, been told is not the truth and so he was not willing to just close the case on his end um so we have that death certificate which just leaves it kind of an open you know ended thing which allows us you know to take her for 
um, civil sue. Um, but you know, the fact that she's criminally not being sued is just charged with anything is just mind boggling in itself to me. We shouldn't have to necessarily go down this path. How did Megan or her family react or behave after Remy passed away? Did they, um, with they, they actually, they um, never, never reached out to us, never reached out to our family. Um, and in fact, um, they declined a lie detector test, which mm -hmm. really, you know, makes me feel even more like um, there's more to that story. Um, about, a, no, maybe it was six to eight months later, I did get a card from the mom, the babysitter's mom, um, and it just was a card that just said, sorry, or something basic from the card, and it had her... Um, the mom's um, name and I think the kid's name. It didn't have the babysitter's name in it. And um, a mom that that she had left on her front porch. And my mom received a letter from her, which from her friend, you know, um, the, the mom of the babysitter, which just basically said, like, we don't know why God decided to take Remy and, you know, we never will, but it was basically denying, like, I, I feel like trying to make this whole situation not seem like as if it was her daughter's fault. And it's just, my mom didn't reply. I never responded and that was it, but never got a message from her, never got, and I'm sorry, never got, you know, this is, you know, I feel guilty for this, nothing. Um, in fact, I had posted stuff on Facebook about it and her son, um, the babysitter's son, um, messaged me telling me to remove, you know, his mom from, from my pages because, you know, I shouldn't put her to shame like that. Did the, did the detectives take a look inside Megan's house? Was the day bed still covered in clothes or did she, you know, was it, was it cleared off? Yeah, so they did, and um, they took some pictures, I guess, that we never were able to see, but um, the detectives told us that the bed was completely, um, like, it was made very nice. Um, he said there was even a wet spot um, that they were able to test and get formula um, from. Now, a wet spot hours later doesn't make sense to me on this bed, um, and so I said to the detective, now, did you test her sheets uh, where she was sleeping? Because that's where we believe Remy was. And he was like, no, like, basically, we, we didn't even think of that. Um, I, I think that the, the detective's work in itself was just horrible. They interviewed her one time, um, and that was the day of the incident. They were never able to counter any of her statements or any of her, um, her you know, stories. Um, they never questioned uh, the new babysitter that watched Remy and Callie on Monday to see how uh, Remy was. And see, the, the babysitter's whole story was that she was throwing up. Well, she was spitting up. She was spitting up. And the coroner said, there was no, there was no fluid in her lungs. Like that's not possible. I mean, there's not, that's not the reason why she died. So that whole report doesn't make any sense to us, you know, because there was no fluid in her lungs. So why is the report revolve around the fluid in her lungs? And, you know, if that was such a concern, then why didn't you question the doctor that just saw her a week and a half prior to this incident? And, you know, my mom who watched her the night before and us, you know, that it, they just basically took Megan's word and ran with it. It's, it's quite, it was the poorest work I think any detective could ever do. I, I really do. Because it was, well, the DA said, well, this is just really circumstantial. Do I think that it was neglectful? Yeah, but it's just circumstantial, you know. Basically, we can't pursue it because it's just too costly. Although there's so many people that are in prison for life for circumstantial evidence. So, right. you know, I think that when it's your child, it's a completely different story. And that's just, it's just sick that, you know, these deaths happen, especially even just to my own. And you can just, you know, wipe it under the carpet and move on with your life as if you don't owe them some kind of justice, you know? And I think that in the end, I find, you know, that my faith is strong enough to know that justice will happen when we, when we, you know, get to the Lord, 
But I think in the meantime, it just kills me to know that she's walking the streets freely and my child isn't here because of her, you know? Of course. And you had to see her in person recently, I saw on your blog. Yeah, I um, was driving the other day and I saw her walking um, down the street, I'm assuming to her mom's, as she had a towel around her shoulder, smoking a cigarette, I think. And I, you know, I think it did go through my head. Should I yell something out the window or curse her out or even just drive my car right over, you know, onto the sidewalk? But I did it. I just drove by. And after I got to the stop sign, I just broke down crying, just thinking to myself, like, how nice, you know, she can walk to her mom's and enjoy the day when I'll never have the chance to walk with Remy, you know, and enjoy the day with her because of her. So it's not fair at all. I'm so sorry. I, I've been reading your page, the uh, Remy's teachings page. And Mm -hmm. uh, I, admire your strength so much it's unbelievably inspiring but i can't imagine what you i mean you put it into words beautifully what you're what you're going through and i really think that 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 could help other bereaved parents uh the way you put it is just so expressive and uh, visceral you know it it really paints a picture of how much you're suffering and and how your faith is getting you through it Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's all I have to get me through every day is that I'll see her again, you know? Absolutely. I can't imagine not having it. And then I just, I wonder what people do that don't have God in their lives. You know, what hope is there then? Right. So that's the hope that I cling on to. And I believe it, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you put that into words beautifully as well, just how you you feel about it and, and how you're surviving and getting through and how is your husband handling all of it um he's depressed i mean i don't think i think his family doesn't live around this area so he really has just my family and i feel like you know he he has a hard time leaning on anybody for support i think that's a struggle in itself um that he doesn't feel like he has a lot of you know, support or people to be open with. Um, There are nights that I wake up that he won't be in the house and I'll walk out back and he's crying or um, there's a couple of times that like I've woken up and he's kind of been bent over into Remy's uh, rock and play that still sits next to his bed. Um, I think mostly he beats himself up over the fact that we were in an argument the night before and the night before this incident had occurred and he never gave her a kiss goodbye because he was just so upset with me that he didn't want to come back into the room. Um, And he said to me, he will just, you know, have that regret for the rest of his life. And that is hard for him to swallow as well. So, I mean, I think he's trying, he feels like he can't, you know, be weak in front of me. Um, and I don't, like I said, I don't think he has anyone really to lean on besides my brothers and my family. So that I think it's hard. It's really hard for him. And I don't think people realize that, you know, he's suffering with it too, you know, because it looks like he's not. I am so sorry this has happened. And just looking at the pictures of Remy, she was gorgeous and so sweet. Do you want to tell me a little bit about her and what she was like? Sure. She was, honestly, she was so perfect. She was like, she never cried, you know, and she was just, she has, our, she was our first blue eyed girl. Um, she was beautiful. I mean, I just, she would just lay there staring at us, you know, and just smile and her smile would just be so, it's, I just can't explain how perfect she was and angelic. And she's just, Oh, you have no idea. I wish I would have taken a million more photos and videos of her. And you never know what you have till it's gone. And I just, she was to the point she was, um, you know, starting to get more of a personality. And um, she would always recognize my husband. You know, every time we come home, I get, I, my husband always says like, he, she could smell daddy. You know that, you know, his voice and everything. And she just was so, I mean, even with sleeping, she'd just be she was like the easiest kid. She'd wake up, you know, once or twice in the middle of the night, not even, you know, cry. She just, 
whimper a little bit. We give her a bottle and she goes right back to sleep. She was just so perfect. It's just one thing that we have to just try to move on every day. I wake up even this morning. I'm like, I don't know how I'm just going to get through today. Like, it's just a struggle just trying to move. And you think to yourself all the time, you know, like, do people look at me and think, wow, she's, I don't know how she's, you know, doing things or I don't know how she's working or, you know, cause when it's, when it's not your child, you would, you know, even before Remy passed, I'd always be like, if that happened to me, I would, you know, not live anymore. If that happened to me, you know, and my husband says um, that he, he said a lot of um, things play through his head too. Like he would always be, you know, if that happened to me, I would go and kill the babysitter. And then when it happens to you, you obviously can't act that way, you know, but you feel like you, you, it will never be you. And then when it is, you're just like, it, it's just life is just completely different. Everything about life, you know, is not how it once was anymore. I wanted to ask you also about uh, Remy's purpose. Yeah. Well, Remy was buried in Montoursville Cemetery here in Pennsylvania. And it was comforting to go there for a while and, you know, to walk around and, you know, just look at different um, stones and plots and, and the people that are there. And one day when I was walking around, um, I came up to a, like a, um, it was a kid's portion of the cemetery. And I started to read um, the stones and there were some that didn't have stones, but they were the temporary markers that they put on the um, plots. Mm -hmm. And one of them said like 1987. And suddenly I just stood there and I thought, wow, since 1987, this child hasn't had a stone, you know, because people don't realize how expensive burial, you know, funeral and burial expenses are. And I think that it was, I know that if it was not for the generosity of so many people, you know, we would not have been able to honor Remy the way that we were able to um, with the stone and, and everything. Cause it is so pricey. So when I was looking at those temporary markers, um, it just dawned on me, like, you know, that there. I think there's 30,000 plots where she's currently buried and there's thousands with temporary markers. Um, and I wanted, I just prayed to God, like, give me a purpose for her. And at that very moment, I, it was like, God was telling me like, make a purpose to help people with funeral and burial expenses. Um, so I established Remy's Purpose, which is a nonprofit organization um, that provides uh, financial assistance for burial and funeral expenses um, up to $2,500. So um, if somebody, you know, has lost a, a child, a friend, um, a spouse of any age, um, and needs assistance with, um, you know, a viewing or a burial site or, um, a stone, um, they can use our organization to, um, get, you know, financial assistance through and it goes directly to the funeral home or the cemetery. Um, and, you know, they're able to hopefully honor their, their loved one. Um, in a special way, as we were able to honor Remy in a special way. Yeah, it's a shame that sometimes I think work to people becomes just that, you know, it's not something that they love or they do, you know, it's just something that they go through every day, you know, and that's what bothers me is that I find that, you know, if they, if it was their child or their loved one, it would, I think it would be completely different, you know, and so in my work now, I always try to remember that, like, don't just make this a job, make this something, you know, that you want to do for others, because that's what it's for. You know, it's not just a paycheck. Thank you again. I really, really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about Remy and telling us about her. And and I wish you and Matt and the girls the best. Thank that- you so much. Keep an eye on the blog and podcast social media pages for any future updates on Remy's story. A huge heartfelt thank you to Marjane Frelin for bringing Remy's story to my attention and to Ashley Cohen for sharing her beautiful daughter's story with us. I know talking about it wasn't easy and it probably never will be, 
but Ashley knows better than anyone how important it is to keep the discussion going, not only in the search for justice, but the essential mission to keep Remy's memory and purpose alive. Rest in peace, Remy. You will never be forgotten. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter at STLCPod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from AudioJungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.